Welcome to Nephrotube Online Lectures. In this lecture, we will discuss rhabdomyolysis from pathogenesis to bedside. We are discussing uh, chapters of Oxford and the Book of Nephrology and Hypertension. We are now discussing chapter 2, acute kidney injury. We discussed before contrast-induced nephropathy, and now we will discuss rhabdomyolysis. You will find all our lectures as a PowerPoint on nephrotube.com, and you will find uh, the video recordings in Arabic and English languages on uh, our YouTube channel, Nephrotube. Rhabdomyolysis was first discovered in World War II, as was mentioned by rhabdomyolysis. <clears throat> Regarding this introduction of rhabdomyolysis in Oxford Handbook, I will arrange it in a more uh, strategic way. Uh, rhabdomyolysis may be uh, due to trauma of the skeletal muscle, or it may be due to non-traumatic factors also. Starting by traumatic causes of, of rhabdomyolysis, many causes was mentioned, were mentioned in Oxford Handbook to cause trauma of skeletal muscle. Whatever the cause of the trauma of the skeletal muscle, the presentation will be the same. How trauma and rhabdomyolysis uh, present in patients with acute kidney age? Suggest and suppose this is this uh, uh, circle is the myocyte cell, the cell of the skeletal muscle, and outside it is the serum, the blood. Inside any myocyte cell, you will find uh, uh, some components as the CK, creatinine kinase, the LDH, purines, the electrolytes, and I will concentrate on potassium and phosphorus, amino transferase and enzymes, and it's amino transferase enzymes and lactate. And sure, we will find my globe. Outside the cell, we will find sodium and calcium. Those are, are the most important related, uh, the most important electrolytes related to rhabdomyolysis. So I mentioned them. What happens when trauma affects the cell? Trauma will cause lysis or damage of the myocyte cell. That will cause exchange between the intracellular components and the extracellular components. So what is inside the cell will go out, and what is outside the cell will go in. And the purines in the serum will be converted to uric acid, and with the entry of sodium to the myocyte cell, it will add uh, osmose water and increase the water content inside the cell, and decrease the water content in the serum, which will cause hypovolemia. And sure, there will be also hypocalcemia due to entry of the calcium inside the cell. So finally, the presentation or the changes in the uh, body uh, due to trauma uh, causing rhabdomyolysis or the exchange between the intracellular content and the extracellular content. Why this patient may present with AKI? The main cause of acute kidney injury in rhabdomyolysis patient is the myoglobin that uh, moved from inside the cell to the serum and it will be filtered through the glomerulus and it will concentrate it in the tubules causing direct oxidative tubular injury. And this will cause a form of acute kidney injury and acute tubular necrosis. As myoglobin will be in large amount in the plasma and it will be filtered through the glomerulus. But let's scope more on the acute kidney injury and acute tubular necrosis in patients with rhabdomyolysis. It is not only myoglobin. Many factors will cause acute tubular injury in this patient, and this image or draw that I will show now is very, with this, this graph is very important because it summarizes the pathogenesis of acute tubular injury in rhabdomyolysis, at it, and it will be uh, the same graph that I will be used to treat this case. With muscle injury, as we said, this fluid sequestration inside the muscle as more sodium entry in the muscle, it will osmose more water, which will cause hypovolemia. And the hypovolemia will cause renal hypoperfusion and renal vasoconstriction by renal autoregulation, which will cause ATM. Also, with muscle injury, inflammatory mediators will go out from the muscle to the serum. This inflammatory cascade will cause renal vasoconstriction and ATM. And finally, as we said, myoglobin, myoglobin will affect nitric oxide level, which will cause vasoconstriction. It will cause, it will uh, con be converted, as it will be concentrated in urine, into a cast and cause uh, tubular obstruction. And finally, myoglobin will cause 
the increase in reactive oxygen species and cause protein, him protein mediated tubular toxicity and the final end result is acute tubular necrosis. So multiple factors will cause acute tubular necrosis in case of rhabdomyolysis rather than myoglobin. The most important of the, uh, the most important of them is the hypovolemia and the inflammatory mediators. Okay. So finally, myoglobin and the hypovolemia are the two cornerstones for the pathogenesis of acute tubular necrosis in these patients. This is regarding traumatic rhabdomyolysis. What about non-traumatic rhabdomyolysis? Many causes affecting uh, or causing non-traumatic rhabdomyolysis. Whatever the cause, uh, the pathogenesis is usually the same. Whatever the non-traumatic cause causing rhabdomyolysis, uh, the pathology, the path of uh, the path of physiology uh, is usually the same. Almost all causes of non-traumatic rhabdomyolysis cause cell damage or cell death by affecting the energy stores of the cell. They cause energy depletion and cell death. How uh, is that occur? I will mention it. Uh, in this graph. As we said, this is a myocyte cell, and here are the intracellular contents that we mentioned before, the CK, the potassium, the uh, phosphorus, the uh, LDH, all other co constituents, and sodium and calcium outside the cell. Also inside myocyte cell, there is sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is the main source of calcium stored inside the muscle. As we all know, at the skeletal muscle membrane, there is sodium potassium AT base pump. Also, there is calcium AT base pump on the cell membrane of the muscle and on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Calcium AT base pump, sodium potassium AT base pump needs ATP, need ATP to act. So whatever the cause that will cause depletion of ATP storage, it will cause disturbance of ATP base function. So there will be improper action of these ATP base pumps. The end result will be increased intracellular, increased intracellular and mitochondrial calcium. And the increase in intracellular calcium will cause increased skeletal muscle contraction and the production of reactive oxygen species and skeletal muscle death. And finally, exit change between the intracellular and the extracellular contents and the presentation of rhabdomyolysis, the same as traumatic causes. So, the end result in both traumatic and uh, in both traumatic and non-traumatic are the same, but the start of the uh, disease is different. In traumatic, there is trauma to the cell. In non-traumatic, there is also cell death, but by but by different mechanism, depending on affection of the ATP storage of the cell. Okay, what are non-traumatic causes? Many causes as myopathies, but well, some of the myopathies, drugs and toxins. Electrolyte disturbance, hypokalemia, hypocalcemia, hypophosphatemia, hyper or hyponatremia, endocrinolo endocrinological, and this is very important, hypothyroidism, and hyperglycemic emergencies, and also viral infections, some infections, including viral infections. So the final end result of uh, rhabdomyolysis is that the intracellular elements, whatever the cause is traumatic or non-traumatic, that the intracellular elements and the membrane products are released into the circulation as we mentioned. This is the basic bit, uh, this is the basic bench, bench side uh, talk of rhabdomyolysis. So when to expect rhabdomyolysis? What are the clinical presentations and lab investigations? I will divide this slide into four squares and I will talk about every quarter of these squares in details. Starting by uh, clinical presentation and investigation, starting by the ATN. The ATN in these patients, the frequency reported of acute kidney injury in rhabdomyolysis is about 15 to 50 percent. If the CK is lower than 20,000, there is a lower risk of AKI, although even with low level of CK, but with coexisting condition, so conditions such as sepsis, acidosis may increase the risk of AKI. So, from this slide, we can say that not all rhabdomyolysis are always associated with acute tubular necrosis, especially if the physician interfered, uh, interfered 
uh, air. Regarding the myoglobin, as we see in this slide, the myoglobin will level will be high in serum. So how will this affect the clinical presentation and lab investigation? Logically, you will find red urine because myoglobin will be excreted in urine, and you will find positive divistic for hematuria, although under microscopy you will not find red blood cells, and this will raise the possibility of myoglobin because Dibistic is positive for both myoglobin and red blood cells, but under microscopy you will find only you will not you will not find under microscopy red blood cells, and this will raise the possibility that this is this is myoglobinuria. But it is important to mention that dibistic may be negative for myoglobin for about 20 to 50 percent in patients. This may be because myoglobin uh, appears in urine when the plasma concentration exceeds a certain level and myoglobin has a short half-life and there may be extra renal metabolism and the clearance of myoglobin. So not all patients with rhabdomyolysis and acute kidney injury second to rhabdomyolysis may present with uh, red urine or uh, positive dibistic for myoglobin. Regarding muscle, it is logical that the patient present, uh, presents with muscle pain and weakness but it is important to mention that about more than 50% of the patient of the patients may not report muscular symptoms. So it is also important to be in mind uh, the same as the, uh, the possibility of absence of myoglobin in urine. Regarding the uh, lab parameters in these patients, what we will find? We will find the increase in all of CKLDH or uric acid potassium, phosphorus, amino transferase, and lactate, and we will find hypocalcemia. The diagnostic lab is the CK. Mainly, we prefer CKMM because it is more specific for skeletal muscles, but also CKMB may be raised. It is usually raised about in about 2 to 12 hours after injury and reach, reaches its peak in about 24 to 72 hours, and it is raised uh, to a serum level, uh, maybe over one uh, uh, one thousand, and finally it starts to go down uh, in about uh, three to five days after the stoppage of the injury. So the CK level will go down when the in when the source of uh, uh, injury or the source of uh, rhabdomyolysis, whatever traumatic or non-traumatic, disappeared. So it is important to follow CK level. CK serum uh, half life is about 1.5 days, so it is logic that CK level will decline by about 40 to 50 percent of the previous day's value. So, if there is no decrease in CK as it, as it is expected, you have uh, to think uh, that there is a continued muscle injury by an untraumatic cause or traumatic cause or muscle myopathy or this another factor that uh, cause maintenance of the rhabdomyolysis and muscle injury. Or even you have to think of compartmental syndrome that the muscle pressure is very high because of the entry of water inside this muscle and because of, because of the water that we will use now, the, the, sal the saline and the volume resuscitation that we will use now in treatment, all of this make swell the muscle and to cause increase in the pressure of the muscle, what is called compartmental syndrome, and this emergency that may need fasciectomy. And we will talk in a separate lecture about compartmental syndrome syndromes with uh, the different types of this disease. So if the CK didn't decline, you have to think about that there is a continued muscle injury by compartmental syndrome or that there is another non-traumatic cause causing the rhabdomyolysis. Also, some of the patients with rhabdomyolysis may have the IC because the thromboplastin and other prothrombotic substance within the myocyte cell will extravasate, will go out, will go out of the myocyte cell and may cause the IC, although this is infrequent complication. So, this is the clinical presentation and investigations mentioned in Oxford and Book of Nephrology and Hypertension. We said all of them, but here are some extras that albumin may be increased or decreased according to the volume status of the patient and according to the capillary leak. They mention here 
that the urine may be of a negative analysis for my globin in about 20% of the patient. I said in my slides that it, uh, that my globin will be absent in about 50%. And they said that urinary myoglobin may be used to monitor treatment, although this point is debatable because the patient from the start may not present with myoglobin in urine, but okay, if myoglobin is present, you can use it as a marker for the treatment. So what is, what is the management of rhabdomyolysis? It depends on the <coughs> bench side, the pathogenesis and pathophysiology of the disease. This is a cycle that causes acute tubular necrosis, and we have to break this cycle. We will break these, <coughs> these three parts, volume depletion, inflammatory cascade, and myoglobin, as these are the main important coronary stone arms in the basogenesis and formation of acute tubular necrosis in rhabdomyolysis. We'll start by volume replacement hydration, and this will treat these three factors, that it will correct volume, it will dilute inflammatory cascades, and it will wash out myoglobin from the tubules. We may use bicarbonate effusion, because myoglobin is uh, concentrated in acidified urine, so maybe alkalinization of urine uh, decrease the myoglobin concentration in tubules. We may use mannitol infusion for overdiuresis and washing out of myoglobin in urine. Also, we have to treat hypocalcemia, and we'll talk about this. <laughs> and finally, hyperuricemia will give aluburinol, hyperkalemia managed according to general hyperkalemia management that we all know, and finally, dialysis once indicated. Let's talk about the first four points of management. Hydration, bicarbonate infusion, manitol, and management of hypocalcemia. Starting by volume replacement or hydration is the most important. So what to use for management? As Oxford Handbook mentioned, you can use either isotonic saline, balanced crystalloids, or isotonic sodium bicarbonate. And if there is high volume load of sodium, and if there is sodium load, you can use hypotonic sodium bicarbonate. But actually the use of sodium bicarbonate in case of rhabdomyolysis has some debatable points that I will mention now. But let us agree that the most important point in the management of rhabdomyolysis is hydration and mainly by isotonic saline. You may give up to 12 liter to maintain your output for about more than 150 ml per hour, and in severe traumatic cases, more than 300 ml per hour. You have to continue hydration till CK level decreases to less than 5,000, and till clinical improvement of the cause, and till diurent diabetic is negative for hematuria if the patient is presented with microbial. As uh, general assessment for any patient taking high volume of fluids, you have to carefully assess volume status, urine output to avoid hyperbolemia, and take care again of compartmental syndrome with high volume fluid resuscitation. There may be worsening of edema of the muscles and increases muscle uh, pressure with compartmental syndrome with which may need fasciectomy as an emergency. Okay, what about bicarbonate infusion? Can I give bicarbonate for every patient? There is some precautions for the use of bicarbonate, which infusion in patient with rhabdomyolysis, which make, which make uh, these precautions will make the bicarbonate a second line for management or even may, may, be, not, may, be, may be not used. Give bicarbonate infusion for patients, but take care if severe hypocalcemia is present, because bicarbonate infusion will increase hypocalcemia. So patients with severe hypocalcemia will have to avoid bicarbonate infusion. Also, there must be acidosis, and actually rhabdomyolysis present with a high anion gap acidosis, and bicarbonate infusion must be, bicarbonate level, bicarbonate level must be less than 30 milli equivalent per liter. So you have to give bicarbonate infusion in absence of severe hypocalcemia, in the presence of acidosis and in the presence of low bicarbonate level. What to give? As we said, we ha you have to give isotonic bicarbonate infusion. You can uh, give 1.26% or prepare isotonic 
bicarbonate infusion uh, if the concentration of 1.26% is not available you can mix 150 milli of 8 hypertonic sodium bicarbonate 8.4% sodium bicarbonate with 1 liter of 5% dextrose this combination will give you isotonic sodium bicarbonate okay mixing of hypertonic 150 milli of hypertonic sodium bicarbonate with 1 liter of dextrose you have give, to give bicarbonate at a rate of about initially 200 ml per hour. The main target of management with bicarbonate is to achieve your MPH more than 6.5. So when to stop bicarbonate infusion? If the patient develops symptomatic hypercalcemia, you have to stop. If the patient arterial pH become alkalotic, you have to stop. If the serum bicarbonate level increased, you have to stop. And finally, if you don't, didn't reach your target goal, if you didn't reach your pH more than 6.5 after about 3 to 4 hours, so you have to stop bicarbonate infusion. So the use of bicarbonate infusion in rhabdomyolysis may be complicated. And the hydration with only azotonic saline may be sufficient. Or the use of bicarbonate infusion may be used, but under standard precaution with monitoring arterial pH and calcium every 2 hours to avoid metabolic alkalosis and hypocalcemia in these patients. Regarding mandatory infusion, also it is debatable and its use is complicated in rhabdomyolysis and it is better to avoid it except in experienced hand and hospitals. First of all, to whom, to whom, to whom give manitol to each patient? It is important to give manitol to patients who are not oligoric. Urine flow must be adequate more than 20 ml per hour before giving a monitoring infusion and in patients with high serum CK levels more than 30,000. How to give whatever the dose it is important to know when to stop monitoring infusion. Monitoring infusion increases the osmolar gap so with high osmolar gap more than 55 you have to stop monitor. If we didn't reach a high diuresis more than uh, or for about 200 to 30, uh, from 200 to 300 ml per hour, you have to stop monitor infusion because monitor infusion increases the risk of hyperosmolarity, volume overload, and hyperkalemia. So it is important to know to start monitor infusion, the patient must have adequate urine outflow, about more than 20 ml per hour, and the main target of monitor infusion is to increase urine flow to about 200 from 200 to 300 ml per hour. So if you didn't, if you didn't achieve this point, you have to stop monitor. So also it is complicated, and we, we maybe azotonic saline is enough. And finally, the evidence for the use, as I said, for the use of sodium bicarbonate and manitol in cases of rhabdomyolysis is very weak. Here, what we said in Oxford and book of nephrology and hypertension, they explained urine alkalization and manitol. I will. Point here, extra point that loop diuretics must be avoided in patients with rhabdomyolysis because loop diuretics acidify urine and the acidification of urine will increase the precipitation of myoglobin, which will increase the acute tubular injury and the kidney injury. How to treat hypocalcemia in our patients? Generally, don't treat hypocalcemia except if the patient is symptomatic, hypocalcemia, or give calcium as a step for the management of hyperkalemia to counteract the effect of potassium on the heart. Why not to treat hypocalcemia in these patients? Because with or during the recovery phase, the calcium will move again from the muscles to the serum and the level of calcium will be back to normal. So if I, ha uh, so if I give calcium for management, there may be rebound hypercalcemia in these patients. So avoid calcium replacement in these patients except the symptomatic hypercalcemia and in the management of hyperkalemia. Don't forget, we have to treat the cause. And finally, if the cause is not apparent, there is no trauma, you have to consider non-traumatic causes, especially drugs, virus screen, uh, thyroid profile, and the electrolytes. This is very important if the cause is not apparent and there is no trauma explaining the etiology of rhabdomyolysis in these patients. Finally, we may dialyze the patient with once indicated. Physiotherapy may be essential. The prognosis is generally good. 
if the causative insult is removed and the renal function usually returned to normal even with those uh, who extended uh, or who required that support although as any acute kidney injury there is a long term risk for uh, CKD and there is a risk for hospital mortality, cardiovascular events uh, as any cause of acute kidney injury. Compartment syndrome in rhabdomyolysis, uh, we will explain in later in a specific, in a special uh, lecture about different compartmental syndromes. And finally, the hemoglobinuric uh, acute kidney injury, any hemolysis, any cause of hemolysis, whatever, blood transfusion, uh, uh, falciparum malaria, uh, hemolytic anemias, whatever the cause, Intravascular hemolysis will raise the free hemoglobin level, which will be filtered through the glomerulus into the tubules. And the main treatment here is volume resuscitation because hemoglobin also will be precipitated as myoglobin into the tubules and cause tubular obstruction and acute tubular necrosis. And sure, the investigations will show low hemoglobin haptoglobin and increased markers of hemolysis bilirubin, LDH, uh, potassium, and urine will be also positive for blood. Devastic is positive for hemoglobin, myoglobin, and red blood cells. So in case of hemoglobinuria as here and myoglobinuria as in rhabdomyolysis, you will find positive devastic, but the uh, microscopy will not show any red blood cells. So the coronary storm management of hemoglobinuric AKI, whatever the cause, is volume resuscitation and usually uh, by saline. And here maybe also isotonic sodium bicarbonate uh, may be used as there is no evidence of hypocalcemia in these patients. So you may use sodium bicarbonate, isotonic sodium bicarbonate safely in these patients to alkalinize the urine and prevent acidification of urine and the precipitation of hemoglobin. My home messages, rhabdomyolysis may be traumatic or non-traumatic. Final common pathway of pathogenesis is the leak of intramuscular contents in the circulation. Final common pathway is sequestration of calcium and water in muscles. The hallmark of EKI is acute tubular necrosis. Dipstick may be negative for microbinuria. Muscle pain may be absent at about 50%. Re-rise of CK raise the suspicion of compartmental syndrome or metabolic disorders or muscle myopathies. Coronary stone of management is hydration, especially isotonic saline. The, the use of sodium bicarbonate need precautions and uh, the evidence is weak. The same is for manitol. Calcium supplements need some precautions uh, to avoid the rebound hypo, hypercalcemia. And the prognosis of these patients are generally good and thank you. You will find the record of this lecture on our YouTube channel and you will find the PowerPoint presentation on nephotube.com. Thank you and see you later in the next lecture.